to study with me um, because um, this is so big for just one person to, to, to really unpack. And, and I think that even the timing that we're seeing this in the, the season, the spring feast that we are in, it's pretty awesome. So I was just sharing earlier, so Stephanie, that the, the feast of Yahuwah, the spring and the fall, they are like bookends, so they mirror each other, right? So what's interesting is the start and the beginning is, um, has a, you see the number eight, right? The number eight in it. So that tells me that when we are entering the Moedim, we are entering into eternity because number eight is eternity, right? Infinity. So, and this has always been what's in my heart every time, every Shabbat is entering into eternity, but like entering into the feast of Yahuwah, oh, you're going to get lost in because there's no time. <laughs> there's just no time. So, um, what I was seeing are some patterns. So um, we were talking earlier about how there's different calendars and stuff like that. And, and yet at the same time, um, when we enter into the feast, it is going into outside of time. So, and you know how the enemy has to be caught in a sense where um, he doesn't know what's coming. He doesn't, you know, what, what was that scripture? It says, um, you know, he, ha he knows he has but little time, right? He doesn't really know when this whole thing will come about. But so in other words, I, th I think that Yahuwah has to get him off guard, right? So this is why I think there's patterns to pay attention to. And in the patterns, they're overlaid upon one number after the other. Okay, so. Okay, so some of the things that uh, I'm just trying to get my mind into my notes, okay. Um, all right. Okay, so we talked about how entering the feast is like an eternity because there's number eight that is really in the Pesach and unleavened bread and the number eight is in the uh, feast of Sukkot and as well as the eighth day. Okay, so how I came about noticing this pattern is you all know that number 40 is near and dear to my heart, near and dear to my heart. And so when I looked at in Acts 1, right, when um, we know that the, the number 40 is marked by when the resurrection of Mashiach um was on that uh you know the first fruit that mark number one of 40 okay and then we see that for 40 days right for 40 days we see that in acts 2 that yahusha was seen alive for 40 days and um he only spoke nothing but kingdom 
right? I think here, here I, I have it here. Um, of all that Yahusha began both to do, this is in Acts 1, until the day in which he was taken up, this is the 40th day, after he, through the Ruach HaKodesh, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of Yahuwah. And how interesting is it that the word Omer, because remember, we're counting Omers, right? The root word of that is Amar. Okay, and Amar is another a Hebrew word for speech or to say. Okay, so like in Genesis 1, where it says, and Elohim said, let there be light. The word said, if you look at the Hebrew of it, is Amar. So when I was looking at the number 40, and I realized that on the 40th day, Yahusha ascended, I was also wondering about the 10 days that remained until the Feast of Pentecost, the Pentecost, number 50, right? So those are just, so you know, some of the things where my mind is working at. So there's the number 10. It's almost like a waiting period, right? So out of this little study that I ventured off in, I realized that there are numbers. Uh, there are numbers that sort of overlay the number 50, 40, 10, and even seven and three. So in these numbers, and I know already, we're not gonna be able to unpack all of it tonight, but I just wanna get you all, we all to start thinking about it because I know that perhaps the Ruach, I know the Ruach will show us more things, right? But there's substance and there's significance in these numbers. Um, it also is interesting because I was able to see patterns in the story of Noah in Genesis 6 and 7. And I don't know if you've heard of the second Passover, but it's really interesting that the second Passover, I see that as a mercy and grace. It's like a, it's like a, a provision of Yahuwah that he avails to us. And the details of that is uh, put into Numbers 9, okay? Numbers 9 says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, if any one of you or your posterity is unclean because of a corpse or is far away on a journey, he may still keep Yahuwah's Passover. Okay, so, so you know, some of the things that really, that got me to really start looking into it, the second Passover as well is this. Um, could there be an, an event? that is on our future, near horizon, right? That prevents us from keeping the Pesach on the, on the 14th of Nisan because either we are unclean because we're handling dead bodies or perhaps because we have been, uh, we, there's a, 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 a sudden journey that we all have to take. Just like in Matthew 24, when you see the abomination of desolation, leave, run to the mountains, right? What's interesting is, is that in Noah's time, I don't know if you've studied this yet, but I'm just going to give you the, 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 in a nutshell, and then you can study it yourself. But you see how they entered the ark and the floodgates opened. I heard of this, I can view it as, Ah, well, you know, Sister Stephanie, good question on the chat. You know, there's layers of understanding. Um, and this is why, this is why we're doing this. We're coming together because we're sharing what the Father is, is, is putting in our hearts, right? But think about why um, the floodgate and Noah and them entered a month after. So in the second month. I? Yes. <laughs> Uh, Methuselah died the year of the flood, and Noah would have been bearing his grandfather. Yes, <laughs> because his father had already was already dead. 
Yes. And so he would have been the closest of kin responsible. Exactly. exactly. Think about and they th entered in and they entered in on the tenth day of the second month. On the tenth day of the first month, they would have been, as it were, choosing their lamb. <laughs> so he brought them in to they had chosen to be with him. He brought them in, and there is no more distraction from all these people out here. Oh, I think of the Father. <laughs> and so now they're all closed in, sheltered, choose the lamb, pondering what their what their salvation now. And then the seventh day, they yes. hear the rain. This on um, the seventh, which is so interesting. I love it because see already you're picking it up. I love it. And and you know, I, I'll share my notes so that you guys for, 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 for those who, you know, Sister Ashley, if you haven't really, you know, sort of bring the two and two together, that's okay. Because it took me a while to see it too. But just so you know, what I'm trying to say is there's a pattern that I'm picking up um in the account of Yahusha in John, when you know he's the Passover, right? and also in Noah's time, okay? And I wondered why he would have, the timing of the flood and them entering into the ark seems to be correlated on in the second month or in the second Passover, but there's a slight difference, okay? Because we know that Passover is on the 14th of Nisan, right? The first month, but it says here the 17th. So there's a three day difference is what I'm trying to say, three, okay? So just put that in the back of your mind. Okay. So, and, and this is where the scriptural support for that. Why is it so key? Because on the 17th day, okay, that also marks the start of the 40 days and 40 nights. And remember how uh, I just said that we're connecting that with a risen Mashiach for 40 days. You know, he only spoke about the kingdom. And again, how timely is it that Omer counting or Amar is about speech, okay? So, um, okay, so, and, and you know what else is interesting is if you take the, the end of the Noah account, the flood of Noah, it's a year long, right? From the time they got wet until the time the earth became dry. Okay, but towards one year later, before they were qualified to do the burnt offering, they again did the Passover a month later or in the second Passover on the seventh, on the 27th day this time. Okay, so there's another diff, there's another significance to that. But why? Is it wait, wait, could you please repeat that? What do you what do you mean the second pastor of the day did on the 27th? Yeah, so you know a year later, so you know how uh, everything started off like the 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 flood and them entering into the ark was in the second month, uh the second Passover. And if you look right. at after like one year later is when they got out of the ark. Okay, so they got out of the okay. ark in the second month but on the 27th day, okay? There's another waiting period I'm saying is that the Pesach, they weren't able to keep again on the first month. There's another delay. And is it because the earth just experienced death and judgment? So there's another, or is it because, and, and there's two questions because I have a timetable actually that I created that I'll share one day. But is it also because the the earth isn't completely dry yet? So if you think about it, they could still be in a journey. They're in they're still in the ark, and they're not able to keep the Passover in in the first month. They had to wait the next month, right? But it's interesting how they did it on the twenty seventh, which is ten days difference from a year prior, because. Uh, a year ago, they kept the 17th day. A year later, they did it on the 27th of the second month. I guess I, I bring that to your attention because 
there's 10 days there. Okay, there's a 10 day that I wanted us to just put in our minds, okay? Remember, we're dealing with May I say this? I'm I'm kinda I'm kinda lost on your reasoning. They kept the second Passover in the ark, but they couldn't keep the Passover in the ark at the end of it? Sorry, sorry. My, okay, let me backtrack. And I think I understand why. Um, a year later, you're gonna find that Noah and them, after they got out of the ark, they were offering up a burnt offering. So that's right. that's sort of your clue that they are also they're keeping Passover in the second month, a year. Oh uh, well, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't take that conclusion out of that. I saw that as a as a thank offering thing and i have no idea why they wouldn't be able to um why they wouldn't be able to offer a sacrifice in yeah. the ark it was big enough well yeah <laughs> if you think about it they went the burnt offering uh if you read the account it was after they did it after they got out of the ark and they went out of the ark mm -hmm. when the earth was dry I'm going to show you the, the, the timetable that I put together. The reason why I thought it was interesting is because both years, and again, this is just putting it out there, they had to, they had to celebrate or they celebrated in the second month, the second Passover provision. And what I'm trying to say is there seems to be a bookend that I wanted us to be able to connect with John and I want us to see the number 10. Okay, so I'm just putting it out there. We're gonna get back to this, okay? But I just wanna- Okay, well, forgive me. I was just trying to make no some connections <laughs> so, in my mind. Thank you. Course, and this is why there's a note I'd love, you know, I will share the notes and you can check it out for yourself, okay? Because here in Genesis 8:14, you see that in the second month, on the 7th and 20th day of the month was the earth dry. Okay, so number 10 is the number or the number of days um, that took until the day of Pentecost is what I'm trying to say, okay? Now, what's interesting is, and this is just me, I'm gonna bring it to your attention. There's also a 10 days prep days that leads up to the counting of the Omer okay, that I saw in John, okay, then I, so I don't know if you've seen this before, Sister Ellie, but why, I, I believe, I don't believe that the things that are written in the scripture is there just for fun, you know, it's written there for a reason, so if you look at John 12, John 12, 1, why would this be brought up, is my question, okay, it says in John 12, 1, Yahusha, six days before the Passover came to Bethany. Okay, so just six days before the Passover. So if that's the case, okay, if you look at the wording, then this, this, the Passover would be the seventh day. Just, right? Okay. And okay, and I know this is sort of, the reason I'm bringing this to our attention goes back to what I was saying earlier. I see a pattern. So when we, when I see the patterns in the number seven, 40, 50, this becomes all of a sudden outside of time, if you think about it, right? So when I say six days from now, and, and I'm writing an account six days from now, I'm not exactly putting a Gregorian calendar on it. I don't know if you see that, okay? So six days before the Passover, came, Yahusha came to Bethany. So the seventh day would have been the Passover because the account says six days, right? And why I'm bringing this to our attention is because we know that Yahusha was crucified on the Passover. And we know that three days later, he resurrects, right? And he resurrects. And on the day that he resurrects, that really kicks off the counting of the Omer. 
And we know that the counting of the over leads to the Pentecost. Okay, so if you look at seven plus three, that makes 10. Okay, so 10 days. Okay, so, and again, I just want to bring that to your attention. Okay, how important is it that there is this Omer counting that we're doing, we're in the midst of right now? Omer, as, as I've shared earlier, comes from the word Amar. Amar in, Greek, uh, in Hebrew is binding sheaves, and it also means to speak, right? So if you think about it, um, Amar is also something that is uttered so that whoever you are speaking to can understand you, right? So I'm speaking right now, obviously you can, this is my way of communication, so you exactly, Omar also means to bundle up or to gather. Yes, you got it. So we're gathering from the word of Yah. So something about the gathering leads up to the 40 days, which marks a significant event, which is the ascension of Yahusha. And then another 10 days, which is another beautiful, uh, you know, giving of the Ruach HaKodesh, right? Okay. But... I want you to also think that the word, the Amar, is also speaking and uttering. It's sort of like the word of Yahuwah becoming flesh, right? So the word, in the beginning was the word. The word was with Yah, and the word was Yah, and then the word became flesh. Think about it. So the word has become flesh so that we can understand the Most High. We can connect with the Most High. And another interesting thing that came about in the last couple of days is that, yes, Sister Stephanie, binding sheaves to gather. Isn't that interesting that in Joseph's dream, he dreamt about, you know, we they were binding sheaves of grain out into the field and then there's the sheaf rose and stood up, right? So, okay, there's something there too that speaks of, um, you know, in the dream of Joseph, it's foretelling of what's going to come about in the future of Joseph, right? His being second in command, um, Joseph being known as the suffering servant, and Joseph being known as also really the, the reason for the why Egypt was, is, became wealthy. Yes, exactly. So what I'm saying is, um, if you take a look at before the start of the counting of the Omer, which is the 40 days to the, to the, you know, the counting of to the Pentecost, right? 40 days and then 10 and then 50. It's marked by 10 days prior to, is what I'm trying to say. Okay. So 10 days. So what's significant about number 10? So numerically, we know that 10 as far as a Hebrew alphabet, it is the Hebrew Yad, right? Yad is pictured as the hand of Yah. So number 10, right away, you're probably thinking, yes, the 10 commandments, right? So if you're, if you're looking at keeping the 10 commandments and correlating number 10 with the hand, right? Because that's what Yad implies, right? When you're keeping the Ten Commandments, you're like walking. We're walking with our hands held on to Yahuwah's hand. And it's like Yahuwah extending his hand to us and leading and guiding us in this journey. Okay, so what else can we think about when we look at number 10? And I borrowed this from, from Andrew. <laughs> which is I just wanted to say that, that um, 40 minus 10 is 30, which is, that's what we count each day. And then we start a new month, a new day. Yes. So, yes. You know, it's the, the, the circle, the circuit or the circle is, you know, 360 days. So we count yes. 30 days. Exactly. Exactly. So if you look at 10, and, and there's going to be so much here, Sister Stephanie. Thank you. 10 also represents our fingers, right? of both our hands. So if you look at and you compare that in, you know, to 
how we understand the tabernacle is structured if you look at the frame or the what the scripture calls it as ribs that encloses the the tabernacle you know that that structure kind of like the tent like look also comprises of 10 frames or 10 ribs okay and and so if you look at that that's so interesting it it, lo- it does look like we're in the cusp of both of yahuwah's hand so if you look at number 10 or yod it it's something to do with being carried away okay i've got it here carried away to till to give to touch to discipline to form and all that stuff okay so how else further connections okay with the number 10 and so when it comes to biological um we know i'm just gonna whip through this because i can show you the notes afterwards and you can read it for yourself but um there's 46 and i took this from andrew 46 frame members to the tabernacle which is similar to the 46 chromosomes we have in our dna and if you you sum up four plus six it's number 10 okay so what else is interesting is in the DNA, there's also 64 codons, okay? Um, so codons, it's basically it, what um, turns on the code within the DNA. It's a super critical, it does a super critical function because it basically delivers specific instructions to all cellular chemistries. Yes, exactly. Praising hands, right. So codons manufacture protein. So if you think about 10, okay, 64 codons. So again, 6 plus 4 is 10, okay? And um, 10, going back to the 10 commandments of Yah, so if you think about it, codons molecularly is like a divine law or a divine Torah that at a molecular level, it produces life in us. You know, it, it, it's the reason why we do what we do, the reason why we're alive, why we grow. And so the life of Yahweh in us. So truly, um, you know, he, it is, if you look at uh, in John again, the word in him was life and the life was the light of man, right? So amazing stuff about number 10 and also, Sister Ashley, this is something that I, I've been meaning to share with you as well, because you would, you've seen how Andrew talks about 3.14, right? Like the, the near perfect circumference of pi. And we've been talking about the menorah, right? And so we know that there's seven branches, okay? Um, if, you, if you divide, if you look at um, the seven, the, the 22 Hebrew letters, Okay, and, and we know, by the way, that even the number 22 is, is, is connected with our DNA because our DNA has 22 amino acids, okay? Just, okay, good night. But if what you do is if you take uh, 22 and divide it by seven, you get the circumference 3.14. And when we get a chance to study the menorah in detail, you're going to see that there's, in fact, 22, um, I think it was flowers, I can't remember, there's there's a part of the construction of the menorah that is also um, a part of the number 22. But anyway, so what is this number 10? So that's one way of breaking down the number 10, right? Six plus four. But there's another way that I want to break down number 10, which goes back to what we were talking about, the pattern that that we're talking about in John 12. Remember in John 12, it says in John 12, um, six days before Passover. This is interesting. Six days before Passover is in John 12. And so we know that on Passover, that would have been seventh day. And when Yahusha died, we know that there's three days, three nights, three days until he resurrects, right? So seven plus three. I just want you to bear that in mind. Seven plus three is 10. Okay. So one way to break down 
Number 10 is seven plus three. So now we looked at number 10 and what that signifies as far as the Hebrew alphabet Yod. Now we're gonna look at number three and seven. So let's start with number three, okay? Three days seems to be um, something to do with preparation before meeting with our maker, before meeting with Yahuwah. Because we know in Exodus 19, right? It says, Yahuwah told Moshe, go down and prepare the people for my arrival, consecrate them today and tomorrow and have them wash their clothing, right? Be sure that they are ready on the third day. Okay, so for on that day, Yahuwah will come down. So number three, in this context, and there's more, but just in this particular context, seems, seems to something to do with preparation. So number three in Hebrew is the numerical value for Gimel. So Gimel, um, and we know that Mash our Mashiach rose on the third day, okay? And there's power in the resurrection, right? And that's why Yahusha is our go-between with our Abba. But one of the, the way this Gimel uh, is pictured at is a camel lift up or transport. So if you think about it, it's like Yahuwah descending, you know, and it has something to do with his descending, coming down. And it also has to do with being raised up, right? Being resurrected. Okay, so I just want to just keep that in mind. So that's number three. What about seven? So seven numerically is equivalent to the Hebrew alphabet Zayin. Now Zayin, okay, is interesting because it looks like a plow, uh, a weapon of some sort to cut off. That's interesting. And in, in, in this little study, um, part of the examples where this word is related to, this word Zayin, has to do with moving to and fro, flying, flowing, moving, right? Seed. So if you look at the number seven, you know I'm going to take it to the seven spirit of Yahuwah, right? So, and, and, and we know what that is, uh, how that's broken down into, right? So the seven spirit of Yahuwah in this menorah. So if you look at moving like waving the sheaf, yeah, you see? It's amazing stuff. So, okay. So now if you go back to the number 10, and then you look at number three and seven. So number 10 is like the outstretched hand of Yahuwah. And we know who that represents for us, who that is to us. That's our, his salvation, Yahusha, right? And number three is Yahuwah meeting with us to lift us up. He, Yahuwah descending. So number three has something to do with that. And number seven, it's like this plow here. We are cut off. This flesh is cut off, right? So when, when we learn how to walk in the spirit and not in the lust of the flesh, not in the flesh, all of a sudden, Yahuwah's people become weaponized. You see that? You know, if you, when, when we are of circumcised heart, the flowing of the Ruach just flows and moves and we end up flying. We end up getting and meeting him in the clouds. Okay, you see where I'm going, right? So the seven and three, if you combine them, it's number 10. So if you look at the number 10 and after the ascension of Yahusha on the 40th day, can you imagine, just imagine the disciples they were with the Messiah for 40 days and they heard, oh, can you imagine the, the teachings that he was teaching them? In fact, in John somewhere, it says, if, you know, if all of the things that Yahushua taught were to be written down, nothing in this world, it can't be done. It cannot contain it, right? So can you imagine what was the things that were not written down during those 40 days, okay? But, um, and then all of a sudden, we know that the, the Pentecost comes on the 50th, okay? So 
in in the seven and the three to me it seems that this gives us a step by step process in how to first die in this flesh and then so that has something to do with the preparation right the number three we've talked about that in the past and then in order for us to activate the seven spirits of yahweh in us okay so this is done in the burnt offering so all of that is really just to show you that there's a process okay so we know and we've talked about it that the burnt offering has to do the whole burnt offering has to do with surrender so uh and yahusha is the perfect he is he exactly matches the the qualification for burnt offering described in leviticus one okay and now the you know, we're, I, I can't remember if you've read Leviticus 1, it should give us a mental image of what, what that's like. I think we went a little bit into that a couple weeks ago. But it's interesting that, um, you know, even though, yes, we know that Yahushua's body was not burned completely. Okay, we know that. Um, but he, his, his suffering for us was a picture of a complete consumption of suffering that he he actually did for us right so yahusha gave us his all you know he gave us his back to be smitten and all that stuff right his his cheeks uh to those that plucked off the hair off his cheeks his face to shame and spitting and we see that in isaiah 50 um but you know that is a perfect picture of the burnt offering for us because um and that is for us to model after especially that hebrews 5 8 says that though he were a son yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered so he is honestly a perfect picture for us to model after for us to be in obedience we have to see that there's a process to it okay and we talked about that in uh, I remember at the entrance gate when we were talking about the beatitudes um we saw that there's the first three of the nine beatitudes it really you can see that there is this surrender you know blessed are the poor in spirit blessed are they that mourn blessed are the meek and we saw that right so we touched on that and so and i'm going to skip this a little bit because i want to get down to so number three we kind of have a, an idea of what that is but i want to get down to the number seven days okay so we see the patterns uh in the scripture when it comes to number seven we see that that's a seven spirit of the of of, of yahuwah and another pattern we see is the seven days of unleavened bread, okay? And so what I'm saying is, um, could this be a connection also with how we manage our words, okay? So um, one, one thing that's interesting I found was the word bread in Hebrew is lehem, right? We all know that. And that implies food, bread, you know. But if you look at the root word of lehem, it is laham, which means to fight, to battle with, to make war with. Have you ever seen the bread in that manner? <laughs> right? So we're looking at bread and the root word of that. And I'm just talking about bread by itself is to fight, to battle, or to make war. Okay? now what's interesting is if you look at and i've shared this before the breath that was breathed unto adam's nostril the neshama of yahuwah and it's interesting how a part of that word has the seed okay we know that noon is the seed right but the root word of neshama is nasam and it also means to pant of a woman in travail or labor so what i'm trying to say is in the breath that's been given to us so if you think about it the breath is something that we borrowed from yah 
right? This is something that he's given to us. He's loaned to us. But at the same time, a part of the breath that we can expect is a travailing or laboring. Why? Because there's a purpose for the breath, right? There's a purpose. Yahuwah uh, created Adam and gave the breath of life into him. And not only that, Yahuwah put Adam in the enclosure or the garden where he's protected from, right? He's, why is it an enclosure? Yahuwah is protecting Adam from something outside, right? But Yahuwah put Adam in there for a reason, is what I'm trying to say. And we see a little bit of clue in what the, you know, the unearthing of the purpose, the unearthing of the purpose that we have in Yahuwah we, is going to require a battle, exactly. So if you look at the every single day we're battling um, this life because um, you know we are put into this world and it is a battle between spirit and flesh. So if you look at the seven days unleavened bread, right? And we know that leaven is a picture of sin. Yahusha uses that as a symbol of corruption, right? So when we are observing the seven days of unleavened bread, if you think about it, we are, there's no corruption. We're observing, we're practicing what it's like to eat bread that is unleavened, okay? So in a sense, we are, we are purifying from the things, the detoxing from the leavened bread of this world. Call it the bread of Egypt, right? And, you know, and, and, and that, if you think about it, <laughs> is a battle. <laughs> You know, you know that when, when we do physical fasting, it's not easy. When we're doing physical fasting, we have interrupted what our flesh is so used to doing. We have stopped giving it something that it depends on and it's just, you know, it's just being sustained on on a day-to-day -day basis. And so you can see that when we fast right away, the battle between flesh and spirit becomes apparent. But what I'm saying is how necessary is that to prepare us in really partaking of the bread of life, living manna so we can abide in Yahusha. And, and think about it, when we get prepared so that we can enter into that state of readiness, we are now ready to enter into the 40 days of speaking only about the kingdom. Just like what Yahushua did with his disciples for 40 days before he ascended, right? So, so and, and, you know, this is what he says in John 6, right? For the bread of Yahuwah is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the living bread, which came down from heaven. You see, we are what we eat, right? So, what I wanted to make the connection with, okay, because, you know, it's easy for us to just eat uh, unleavened bread. And that's what we've been doing for the number of years that we've been observing uh, the, the spring feast. But I make a connection with, um, with being silent. Remember in the email, I said, is there a connection between the unleavened bread and our own words? Okay, so is, is our own word um, a leaven? Can it be a leaven for us? How we speak, right? The things that come out of our mouth is what is in our heart, okay? So interesting, there's a couple of verses that says um, in Proverbs 10, 19, that refers to the words. And it says, when words are many, transgression is not lacking. Think about that for a second. <laughs> or in the King James Version, it says, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. 
So think about that. Yes, definitely, right, Stephanie? Yes. And then if you go to Ecclesiastes 5, it says 2 to 3. Do not be rash with your mouths and let not your heart utter anything hastily before Yahuwah. For Yahuwah is in heaven and you on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes through much activity and a fool's voice is known by his many words. So, you know, is it, is it possible? And it is because the word actually says, and you know, you're seeing that the way in which we speak and we talk all the time, <laughs> just like we eat all the time, we're eating bread that has leavened all year long. And then all of a sudden we enter into the, the time, the, the most precious time of Yahuwah's appointed times. And now he's saying, okay, for seven days, I want you to partake unleavened bread, right? So if you look at, again, Proverbs 15 too, the tongue of the wise useth knowledge of right, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Speak without saying and hearing without listening, right? Right? And, you know, if you look at a really good example of this is Job's friends, right? Job's friends, and, and this is where I make the connection with the seven, um, the seven days of unleavened bread with burnt offering, okay? Because... We know, and I think I shared this with you a couple of weeks ago, that we saw that Job, uh, with everything that's happened to him, we saw his three friends really come and make an appointment with him so they can really minister and mourn with him, right? So we know that one of the things that they did, yes, good night, my love. One of the things that they did, and, you know, this is why, you know, it's, it's good for us to see that, to appreciate what they've done, is for them to stay quiet for seven days. They did not say a word. So, so that was beautiful. That was right. That was good. And so we see that these three friends of Job, each of them had lots of things to say afterwards. When they, uh, after they had listened to Job, because, you know, if you look at Job, you're going to see that um, Job 3, 4, 5, like there's a couple of chapters that Job really starts to share his heart, pours out his heart. And then after that, you're going to see that Eliphaz starts out a whole chapter with what he was sharing with Job, Job 5, right? And then after that, his other friend, and then the, the other, the third friend, and then they all kind of take their turns, right? All of a sudden, Job's friends had lots to say, okay? So they started out right. They were quiet for seven days. And then they started to say a lot of things. And honestly, I, I, specifically looking at Eliphaz, by the way, his name is interesting because his name is, it has something to do with gold, gold to be refined, okay? But in, in the way Eliphaz starts off, his 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 counsel over job it's it's excellent it's it's full of wisdom but what's interesting is in the end of the story of job you're going to see that in job 42 verse 7 8 yahuwah says specifically to eliphaz so it looks like out of the three friends of job he's sort of the leader or you know the the most influential i guess so yahuwah says to eliphaz my wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, <laughs> as my servant Job has. Can you imagine that? If you study the book of Job, you're going to see that um, if you look at each of the chapters that is, is, is spoken of by each of his friends, on the surface level, it looks right, um, but they're missing something, okay? They are actually missing something. So what was happening was 
they were saying all these things to Job. They were giving counsel and some of them are right, but the substance or the judgment that they were making was fleshly. It wasn't righteous judgment. How do we know this? Because Yahweh says to Eliphaz, now therefore take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams. Go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept him, lest I deal with you according to your foolishness. For you, because you've not spoken of me, what is right, as my servant Job has. So what I'm saying is they may have started off right with the seven days of silence, but they did not, they were not in a position of complete surrender to Yahuwah's counsel or in, in for them to be put in a position where they are able to make righteous judgment, like spiritual judgment over Job's case. What they were doing, eventually it started to come out, was they were giving fleshly judgment to Job. And you have to read that slowly for yourself to see that. And one of the clues in seeing that is, you see how Job reacts to them. Yes. You see how, you know, the way Job was responding to their counsels, okay? So they did start off right, but it just wasn't in complete surrender, okay? And so who was the contrast to the three friends of Job? Because there's another character there that is so interesting when you study. I think there's about three chapters dedicated to this character named Elihu, okay? So Elihu, yes. Oh, you got to. You got to hear Elihu and you got to see the, the reverence that he had before the three friends of Job and Job, okay? Because he recognizes that they are of, of elders. They are these, the, the, three Job's of, the three friends of Job's are elders. And not only that, they are of king. They're priestly. They're king. They're, they're a position. They hold high positions. And they're much more older than Elihu. And Elihu says this about them. So he's like, I recognize that you guys are much older than I am. Right? He says this in Job 32, 6. says, I am young and you are old. So I held back from telling you what I think. You see how, wow, we got to, I hope you're seeing how people in the word managed the way they communicated okay so if anything if you look at the the friends of job you see how they did they sat in silence for seven days so now this character well yes yes but look at sister stephanie it is but but you got to see the spirit of elihu it's beautiful he's like i know that you're old and i'm young so i held back from telling you what i think so what he's doing here is he is really exercising quick, quick to listen, slow to speak. That's what he's doing. You see, he's holding back. He is listening to what these aged men were counseling Job. And he says that himself. He says, I thought those who are older should speak for wisdom comes with age <laughs> and then verse 8 says but there is a spirit within people is someone knocking on my door one second sorry sorry someone hey come 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 i'm, I'm in the middle come or are you still stopping by i'm just talking hey i love you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. sorry and, and just so you know for some reason my speaker is I don't if, if you're saying something I, I may not be able to hear it but just so you know my speaker turned off all of a sudden so it, I'm seeing the pop-ups in the chat but look at what Elihu is saying okay he's like I recognize that you guys are much older and my understanding age should wisdom comes with age right 
He says, but there is a spirit within people. And that's beautiful. This is what we're trying to activate, sisters. But there is a spirit within us, okay? And here's the interesting part. The breath of the Almighty. So the breath there is the word neshama, okay? The neshama. So again, neshama and ruach do different Hebrew words and two different depths of meaning. So he's like, there's a spirit within us, the breath of the Almighty within us that makes them intelligent, that makes them... <laughs> The, there's another translation, and I can't think the other translation, I like it too, but it's, in other words, the spirit of Yahweh, the breath of the Almighty within us, gives us things that, necess that don't necessarily come with age. Um, that's intuition, okay? So I think some translation actually says intuition, I think. But think of intuition. Intuition is something that you don't, you don't necessarily learn. That is the breath of the Almighty within us, okay? Sometimes the elders are not wise. Sometimes the aged do not understand justice. So listen to me and let me tell you what I think. <laughs> do you see that, Sister Stephanie? The boldness of this young man, Elihu. His boldness. Yes, I see that. Right? His confidence has nothing to do with, you know, with, with what the world expects. That boldness. Spirit over knowledge. Yes, it is, it is an anointing, okay? And somewhere in John, and I can't remember exactly where it is, John says that there is an anointing that is from Yah, and then it says, it's in First John, and it says that we are to know all things. Think about that for a second, okay? So now, when you study the account of Elihu, he actually will bring to Job's attention where Job fell short of. You know, a lot in the church, you, you heard a lot about, oh, Job, he was, he was sinless and blah, blah, blah. Yes, there is, there's definitely a, a part where it says he's blameless. Okay, but why is Job found repenting in the end of Job? Okay, so that means there's a part of the whole trial and testing of Job that he was not found in the right standing. Okay, and Elihu helps Job see where he was unrighteous. I love it. And I don't know if I wrote it down here, but but he actually puts Job in position. And what you're going to find is that jo uh, Elihu does a good job in listening. Study Elihu. And by the way, Sister Eli, I love that name, Elihu. <laughs> Elihu, Elihu. But look, when you take your time to read his response and imagine that you are in the presence of Job's three friends, imagine your position being a young one in front of these aged elders, kingly rulers, okay? And you will see that in some of the account, you'll find Elihu recapping what Job was saying. He's like, okay, this is what you said, Job, right? <laughs> and in this, like he recaps it. So that means if you look at Job, how many chapters is that? <laughs> if you look at the amount of words that came out of not only the friends of Job, but also Job himself, Elihu retained that. He listened. Well, he may not be able to uh, you know, repeat it verbatim, but there was a part there that he actually uh, repeated exactly what Job was saying. Um, so... What I'm trying to say is um, there is wisdom that is automatically wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, might, that is automatically in us. It just needs to be accessed. 
it needs to be turned on. If you want to look at the menorah, each of the branches needs to be lit. Okay. And um, so uh, here we go. So I wrote down Elifa. So some of the stuff that I was saying earlier, I just wrote down here. Um, uh, I, I put side note, Job is a scientific book. <laughs> Sisters, this is how I am when I'm preparing my notes. Well, I, I, I get off into this tangent in my mind and I might skip this, but, but it's interesting. I might have to go back to this because um, it says in Job 5, 6, this is one of Eliphaz's advice to Job. In fact, this is his first speech to Job. We, got, we have to break down Job 5 one day and we, and we will because Eliphaz, and remember Eliphaz, his name means my rule, my, my God is gold. That's what his name means. So my ruler is fine gold in a sense. So Eliphaz's words is not to be taken lightly. Okay. And, and in Job 5, he says something that's interesting. For affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble spring from the ground. Think about that. For affliction does not come from the dust. So my question is, where does affliction come from? Okay. And, and we know that Yahuwah Elohim formed Adam from the dust of the ground. And he breathed, breathed his neshama into Adam. Okay. So in a nutshell, I'm not probably not going to say all of these things, but it's interesting that if you look at our bio biology, we are made of 50 to 60 trillion cells. But did you know that that's just the dust? That's from the ground? There are 100 trillion cells on top of our 50 to 60 trillion cells that are made up of microbiomes. Um, microbiomes are bacteria, fungal, fungus, uh, viruses and all that stuff. Just, just think about that for a second, okay? And all of these things um, that, you know, when a person dies, um, they decompose, right? The reason why we don't decompose or the reason why, part of the reason why we decompose to begin with is because these, uh, the microbiomes get turned on. They wake up, like funga, fungus specifically. Um, is what starts the decaying process when a person dies. But do you know what keeps fungus, am I saying fungal, fungus uh, asleep? What keeps the microbiome in its homeostasis, in its proper function to keep us alive is oxygen. It's the breath of Yahuwah. Think about that for a second. I just, I just threw that there. But, um, but it's interesting that David says the same thing. So what Eliphaz was saying is that affliction does not come from the dust. So my question is, where does it come from? Okay. Um, David says, says in Psalm 40, verse 12, four innum innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I am not able to look up for they are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart fails me. <laughs> so you see what he's saying? I'm surrounded by evil, innumerable, right? It is more than the number of my hair, the head on my hair. So what, I don't know if you're seeing it, but what David is saying is um, my microbiome, basically, right? It covers me more than my actual flesh, which is from the ground, right? Which is the, okay. Anyway. So the question is, where was iniquity first found, right? Oh man, this is, give me a second, okay? This is, I just wanna see. Okay, I'm gonna skip all that stuff because <laughs> this is part of my tangent, okay? Um, so going back to, to the seven days. Yes, absolutely. It, the, it, it is from SA10, absolutely. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> But um, I wanted to go back because I want to go back to the seven days. 
And I remember we were trying to correlate seven days to so the unleavened bread, to the burnt offering, to silence. So if you look at David in 1 Samuel 12, 16, we know that because of what had transpired with Bathsheba, we know that Bathsheba's son became ill, right? And David seeked and afflicted himself for seven days. So that's why I'm making the connection, okay? So if you look at 2 Samuel 12, 16, it says, David therefore pleaded with Yahuwah for the child. So what David did was he fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. So he pleaded. He, in, in Hebrew, that's bakas. It's to seek, require, desire, exact a request. So, you know, when we're fasting, Yahuwah, we do it on for a reason, right? And we're fasting because really we're seeking, we're, we're desiring, we're requesting. So my question is, when he was fasting for seven days, okay, uh, and, and by the way, fast, the, the Hebrew word for fast is zoom, okay, and, and that, yes, it means to abstain from food, right, but the primitive root of that is really to cover over the mouth, cover over the mouth. Have you ever thought of fasting? as covering your mouth, in other words, going in silence? Do you think that David was silent for seven days? Do you think that he was? Okay, because 2 Samuel 12, 18 says, then on the seventh day, it came to pass that the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him and he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. But um, what I'm saying is he would not heed our voice. So in that, I can imagine that the, the servants of David couldn't even, you know, didn't even sense uh, that they could approach him because they couldn't even talk to him. So I, I just, you know, I just, I, I thought that that was so interesting. And, and if you look at Psalm 43, you know, we've seen this, we've looked at this before. He has put a new song in our mouths. So for Yahuwah to put a new song in our mouth, that means we need to cease, in a sense, from singing our own song. Like we need to stop our own so that Yahuwah can put a new song in our mouths. And we, we, we walk in this, like even Sister Ellie was showing, was sharing with us her testimony of, of Yahweh trying, you know, putting, uh, you know, composing in her spirit songs, you know, from the word. And, you know, there's sometimes there's a battle of, you know, of writing it down or, or retaining it. But then when you're in silence, when you wait on him, when you're, and then it comes back, you know, like it's just, and Sister Ellie, you have, you have a number of songs that Yahuwah has put in your heart. But for that to happen, you must have, you're like, you must have had to stop from flesh, you know? So if you look at Isaiah 58, right? Look at Isaiah 58. And I don't know if you see that there is a, there's an aspect there about silence. Okay. So unleavened bread could it also be unleavened words and so i know that we've like for some because we're on different calendars right we've you know we've stopped from observing unleavened bread we've we've i think we're past that right um but i think we we in the calendar that i that i'm in <laughs> we're still in it right so and this is a part of what i had shared with my little kohel my little group is fasting from our own words, right? And if you know, you know that fasting is one of the most effective ways to detox. And what happens if you've done fasting, one of the things that happens is your five senses or your senses 
uh, specifically taste and smell becomes heightened. I don't know if you've tried it, but I have done without for five, five days and I wanna do more or, you know, but whatever. But what I found is that your, your senses gets heightened. So is it possible that when we are in silence, silence, we become very effective in detoxing and becoming our awareness of our own thoughts and what we hear all of a sudden becomes heightened, right? Becomes heightened. And if we're preparing to enter the set apart place, the counting of the Omer, and, and remember, I'm the way I'm seeing the counting of the Omer is exactly what Yahusha was exemplified for us in that he only spoke of kingdom matters, kingdom things. So it makes sense if we're going to, you know, we're, how can we speak kingdom when we haven't cleansed, we, we haven't detoxed, de purified ourselves from the words, right? And so, and what I'm saying is when we do that, um, we activate the seven spirit of Yahuwah within us. And you see how the, the menorah in its completion, right, lit up each of those branches. And I think this is, oh, all right. Okay. Oh, and one more thing. thing sorry. So here's a part of what I was, okay, one more thing, and I'm, I'm going to end. Um, uh, I put down here, Psalm 40 is about burnt offering. We talked about Psalm 40. And, and that is, you know, we talked about David and I don't know, did we talk about Psalm 40? I can't remember. Sorry, because there's a number of teaching groups that I do that I can't remember. But anyway, Psalm 40 is about burnt offering. And I think we're going to go there. I think my intent was to break it down, but maybe we'll do that next time. But what I'm, what I'm saying is uh, John 16, 13, but when um, the spirit of truth comes, the Ruach will guide us unto, into all truth. The Ruach will not speak on his own. The Ruach will speak only what she hears. The Ruach will tell you what is yet to come. And so what I was saying is David is the beloved of the uh, Old Testament, okay? But then if you look at the New Testament or New Covenant, I don't know if I'm there is this other beloved that we hear of, and that is John, okay? So John is the other beloved. And, and what, I'm, what I love is that if you study a little bit about John, he is quiet, you know, he, he is, he's humble. And if, if you see John, the way it's written, it's written in, he speaks in third person. Like he never refers to himself, uh, like I, John. He, he'll always say the disciple who loved Yahusha. So what I was saying is that he exemplifies the spirit, the character of the Ruach, which I just read in John 16, which says the Ruach does not speak on her own, right? And what's amazing is because John is in this demeanor, right? Who was the book of Revelation given to? right? And if you look at John, he's the one who lived the longest. If you look at John, he's the one that's nearest to Mashiach's breast. And he received the revelation of Yah. Anyway, so this is what I had. Let me unshare. <laughs> and so if anything, wow, you know, I haven't even gotten to, so just to recap, the seven, I'm seeing that before the counting of the Omer, there's 10, right? 10 days. And then after 40 days, so 10, 40, and then 10 to 50. Do you see that? I don't know if you're, and, and it's the same thing I, I'll show you next time, but I saw the same patterns in, in Noah, in the Noah account. So I know nobody talks about the 10 days prior to the first, I have never, at least I have never heard anyone talk about it. 
um, I have never seen anyone or heard anyone talk about the number 10, which is book ends, is what I'm trying to say, book ends in the spring feast. Um, and we see that number 10 is preparation for the counting of the Omer or the 40 days. And then there's another 10 days, another preparation until the, the Feast of Pentecost. Okay, so I know that's very immature right now, but there is so much more to that. And, and remember the number 10, its significance, which I went over earlier, you know, the Yod, right? So that's sort of what I have. I don't know if I, if I kind of absolutely we are to take out the leavened in our hands. All right, hallelujah, you're right, Sister Stephanie. So that's sort of where my heart is at. And, and, and since that was what was in my, um, what I was sharing three weeks ago, probably. The, yeah, two, two weeks ago. And so there's been, there's been more added to that, but I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. What do you, what do you, what do you think about, you know, the, seven days, the unleavened bread and the silence and the burnt offering. I, I thought that, that was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Excellent notes. I have never um, <clears throat> thought about the number 10 before like that. Um, you have actually given me um, a newfound thinking. <laughs> so um i definitely would um i definitely would if i would appreciate if you would share your notes absolutely that way i can go back throughout the week and kind of um dig in more yeah because it's yeah. very interesting to me um yeah. and the way that you actually made the connection was spot on yeah. to what um everything i was telling i was talking about so that's awesome thank you sister and here's the other thing when you start, you start not seeing the number 10 from John 12, okay? So recognize that John 13 is the, the washing of the feet, okay? So in John 12, it starts off by saying, in Yahushua, six days before Passover. So just, just count that. And so the seventh day would have been the Passover and then the three days count three more days until the the um the counting of the omers if you think about it right and the revelation that yahusha shared in john 12 is huge so what i'm saying is there's a prep day it's almost like a it's like getting our hearts conditioned right prior to entering the 40 days Okay, and if you look at Noah, you're going to see the same thing. There is, there is this uh, 10 days, actually, you'd have to, I'd have to share my notes in the timetable with you for you to see it. And then they entered the ark and that's when the floodgates opened. And that's when the 40 days and 40 nights happened. And so why I'm seeing something here is because Mashiach says, as in the days of Noah, so shall, show, so shall our time be. So there's, you know, there's something there is what I'm trying to say. Something for us to, to just pay attention to. What is it? What is it about the 10? What is it about the 40? What is it about the 50? What is it about the seven and the threes? And so I think that I sort of, I feel that I've just given you a high level. And obviously with, with my notes, you'll be able to go back yourself and, you know, sharpen each other with what you end up seeing. Because remember seven, this is seven, right? And um, and if you look at the mids, this is the mids, but then there's three 
there's three sections, there's three sides that are mirror image to one another. Or you can look at as a, the tabernacle as three sections. So there's definitely something for us to glean from. And why it's so important is because when we start to see numbers and when we start to have images put in our minds, we can think better. Do you know that our brain thinks in pictures? Okay, so our brain thinks in pictures. That's why we are to think on whatsoever things are, you know, and, and that's why we are given pictures all over the scripture, especially the tabernacle, <laughs> especially the tabernacle. That's so funny that you just said that because what came to my mind is the menorah and like the seven spirits of the menorah. But then there's also the third three-part man, the body, soul, and spirit, and seven and three make 10. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes, you're <laughs> That's right. Awesome. That's right. And then you'll see more things. So if you look at the five senses, right, plus seven, what number is that? 12. 12, oh, yeah. And 12 is a, is a, a number of, a picture of perfect governance. That's why there's a 12. And then double portion that, you get 24. Think about that. <laughs> right? And so, yeah, so this is sort of what I've got. And sisters, I, as always, I just look forward to see where the Ruach leads us because I know some of this stuff is, trust me, it's the same thing. I don't get it all. But just when you wait on the Ruach, ah, oh, it's beautiful. Go ahead, sister. Um, well, I mean, I'm, this is only my third Passover, but previously I had only known first fruits to be on the 16th, which is what, you know, I had celebrated on the 16th. Um, but then I listened to Jim Staley give a talk and he was talking about the 17th and particularly because of 10 plus seven and the symbolism behind that for the 17th. Um, which anyway, then just kind of ties into to all of this as well. And then I was also trying to figure out with the counting of um, the Omer and the, um, when Shavuot was, because I thought it was on the 15th of the third month, which, you know, it does in Jubilees, it does, you know, that is how, it's, how it is shared a lot of the times. But then in the Targum, it was saying that it was on the sixth day of the third month, so when I went and tried to count the 50 days, starting from the 16th, it came out to 51. But then when I did it from the 17th, then it came out to 50. And so anyway, it was just the shift of like, I'd never heard it before on the 17th and then breaking it down into the 10 and the seven and, you know, and then how this ties into all of this too. So you see that there's a pattern. There's the patterns in the sevens, even the 10. And if you look at 10, you can break it down in seven and three. Mm -hmm. And then there's, these are significant numbers, three and seven. Mm -hmm. And I, so I thought it was interesting that um, you see that it's almost like it's a preamble. It's a pre, you know, to what's in the 40. It's so interesting. What's in the 40? Think about how many what is the full term of pregnancy? 40 weeks. 40 weeks. What are we supposed to bear? Fruit. The fruit of the rule. Do you see where, and then again, now going back to the tabernacle, where it looks like a womb. You see? All oh, th so think about this. So 18, right? So 10 plus eight, eight is the number of, we do this for eight days on lemon bread. And then the yes. number 10. So that's amazing. That just came to me. Yes. Yes. It, Yahuwah, you know what I'm starting to realize is he is so like, what we're tapping into is just surface level we're just scratching the surface there's so much more and it's not a heavy burden it's just the delight in it is um by seeing the patterns watch when you start reading the scripture you'll pick it up like 
for example, in Job 5, you're going to see um, man is born into six, into six troubles or something like that. And then on the seventh, no evil shall touch him. Man has been born into six evils or something like that. But you see how these patterns will all of a sudden pop up. And then you'll now be able to have a fresh appreciation of what the Ruach is showing you about that specific scripture passage. Mm -hmm. Just like the, the friends of Job, seven days of not saying anything. David fasting for seven days, afflicting himself, like all these things, right? And you make the connection with, um, oh, wait till you read Psalm Isaiah, uh, was it Isaiah 58, the famous fasting passage? You're going to see, not my words. I will cease from my words. And then you'll see in the end, Yahuwah spoke. So you see, for us, for Yahuwah to be found in us speaking, you know, through us, we have to cease from our own words. If you look at Isaiah 58, you're, you'll see a flavor of that. It's, it's amazing stuff. And, and the other thing uh, that I'm seeing too, in terms of you talking about the patterns and taking out of the context of, or not, separating ourselves from the the calendars in terms of the way in which that we're thinking about um is how yahweh has been presenting himself to me and it is through music it is through an orchestra so it's these patterns within music on a certain scale you know that aren't necessarily locked into these certain notes because you know you can you can change the keys and so forth but the patterns still still remain the same um so that's so true so you can because we're not fixated on um you know it, it's not it's like because it's the patterns that we that we are starting to see then you can overlay them mm -hmm. maintain the pattern and at the same time express creativity and uniqueness in how because we all have a different anointing it's Oh, Abba, may you help us. And I'm, I'm hoping maybe this is where we go next is, what is it? We have to see the anointing that we have. We have to recognize it from three different perspectives. We have to see it from the, the person, the place, position. And, I, and, and within that, you see the purpose. So, and this became so clear to me. And, the, and maybe this is where we venture off next because we're now recognizing, I see that we all recognize that there is, there are patterns and that these patterns, they're meant for us to be able to lift up and apply to various uh, passages in the word. And when you do that, you get all of a sudden your own, your own, it's like your own download from the Ruach. You know what I'm saying? Your own. And that becomes so precious to you that you can then expound and express it that no one else can in a sense. And we all have each of that uniqueness in us. So, so perhaps next time when we, I'm going to show you a little bit of the pattern in Noah that I saw. And then we'll jump into like 1 Corinthians because... Oh, the Ruach put something in my attention in 1 Corinthians 11, 12, 13. Is it 11, 12, 13? 4? And, and it's just beautiful. And when you see that, you, you, for us to be able to exercise our authority in Mashiach, we have to recognize that there's a place for it, there's a position, and there's the person. And if we don't, if we cannot tell, if we're able to tell the difference in the three, then you'll know when and how to operate in that anointing. So what do I mean by that? Um, President Trump, like, or let's say Trump, Donald Trump is no longer the president because he's left his Oval Office. So the position of president is no longer his, 
it's someone else's, but they're still Donald Trump, right? They're still the person of Donald Trump. So, but then there's the Oval Office or that position of authority. That position of authority needs a person to sit in that office, right? So the Oval, the oval Office in and of itself is useless without the person sitting in it. Do you see what I'm coming from? So now you look at Adam, the Garden of Eden is that place of enclosure, that oval office, the delight. You, you see where I'm coming from, sister? The purpose, the delight is in that place. The, th this is why we're learning how to enter into it. So, so far, everything that we're talking about is to, to, to enter into the secret place because that is where the position of authority we're able to exercise in. So if we're not in that place, we are just our person. And that's, that's fine. We all, we, there's a journey, right? There's a time. If Ecclesiastes, you see, there's a time and purpose for everything. But then we're, we're, in, a, we're in a time now where we need to find ourselves in the set apart place because what's coming we know this what's coming is dark it's already here so we need to light up our light each of our menorah branch right the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me these do and the god of peace will be with you